these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. All right, Jim Pete in the house for another Jim Pete Thursday edition. Kyle Tige is here. It's a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast. Uh, Road Warrior Jim Pete with the great beige curtain look behind your head right now. Really brings out your eyes, Jim Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nondescript, actually, but it's close to the arena, so I can walk to the arena today. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like yeah, Indi- Indianapolis has been kind of, a, kind of a sports hotbed here the last year. The NFL Combine was in town. Everyone goes to that St. Elmo's Steakhouse and gets the, the giant shrimp cocktail with the horseradish sauce. That's the big, that's the we, popular place. We tried, yeah, St. El- Elmo's is awesome. Um, Harry and Izzy's is the sister restaurant, yeah. which is next door. So, if, um, yeah. I mean, like, um, St. Elmo's is like Murray's Steakhouse. It's kind of like old school, you know? Um, and Harry and Izzy's is a little more a little more upscale and a little more uh, up-to-date, and it's bigger. But they share a kitchen, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure it's one yeah, they kitchen. Share, they share, yes, they share a kitchen. We we tried getting into Marnie's here with us. Marnie's uh, sidelined today because nice. Katie's not traveling. And so Marnie's uh, not doing – she's not hosting tonight, so she's with us. So we went last night. And Marnie's has a pretty um, bland sort of palate. You know, she <laughs> pepper is spicy for her. Like pepper is like way, <laughs> way too spicy for her. <laughs> and salsa, no, she's not doing any kind of salsa. So she is sure as heck isn't doing like San almost like the, the horseradish, like like <laughs> shrimp cocktail. Uh, so I just I, I just was hoping, I was hoping to have her try just a sliver of it, just because like you have to at least try it once, right? And she said she just hates the burning sensation of spicy food. I'm like, well, you're also missing out on the burning sensation of spicy food. Like it's a, it's yeah. an acquired really place. disappointing, yeah. really that's, disappointing, that's, Marnie. Really. That's the that's the North Dakota in her. The Minot, just meat and potatoes, yeah. just like me. Uh, Pepper is <laughs> enough. Don't need anything fancy. Jim, you are a uh, wolves related. You're this is like a ten day road trip for you guys. Eleven day road trip. This is the last big road trip of the season. What's it like packing for that? Oh man, I I'm just used to. I even brought my golf clubs, so I you know. Oh I'll, good, okay. That's I'm not what getting I as much blowback. I'm not as giddy as you know, because like the way we travel, um, you know, we're on the team charter, and when we get off the plane, we load into two buses, and then there's an equipment truck, right? Mm-hmm. And so we don't wait for the equipment. We just take off on the buses, and then we get to the hotel, and then those of us who don't get Bellman service with our bags, who have to wait for their bags to come off the truck, <laughs> we have to wait for the truck. And then get our stuff off the back of the truck, right? I mean, it's this is all first world problems, right? But, slumming um, it, really slumming it, yeah. So, but in but in years past, though, like Greg Farnham, our trainer, he would like he'd see my golf clubs on there, and he'd like pretend like he was going to throw them down the street or whatever, because like no <laughs> one gets to play golf on the road until D'Lo came. D'Lo played a lot of golf on the road. <laughs> D'Lo played, uh, played a lot of road. He golf. played on off days. He played on game he days. Yeah, he loved lot. to golf. In some ways, I hated it, but some ways I loved it because I, I wasn't the only person bringing golf clubs. So yeah, so I got my golf clubs. I got um, I have my uh, my garment bag. Um, the garment bag that I have is actually, I call it the world's greatest bag. And so I had the world's greatest bag. I got it from the Golden State Warriors. So think about that. I played for the Warriors in the '90s. So. I kept that same bag forever, and then it finally wore out. And my wife made me an exact replica of it. So what? Yeah, she she made she got it for me for Christmas. It was the greatest gift because she knew I loved it so much. And we tried going back to the Warriors to see if they knew where to get it because the same equipment manager is still there. And uh, she found anyway. She found a woman to remake it for me. So I have the golf clubs. I got world's greatest bag, and I got my suitcase. So I love it. I hey love man, it, the I, Warriors. I don't travel, I don't travel light. The Warriors had the same equipment guy from from the the early '90s all the way through yeah. the dynasty. That's a that's a great run for that guy. It sure is. Yeah. What, hey, one more real basketball question. We can get into Carl or whatever going on um, with a with a road trip like this. When Finch was out here and you guys were out here uh, in the Portland two games, Finch said he kind of preferred road games and road trips because you kind of got away from all the personal distractions you could have going on in your life being at home. What was it like for you as a player? In the NBA or coach in WNBA, did you kind of embrace or enjoy these road trips to kind of get a feel of what your team is all about? Yeah, I mean, um, 
Yeah, God, it's been so long since I was a player traveling. It, it was awful because we had to fly commercial, and it was like yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like we were sitting there at the same gates as like every other person, and so you get all these questions, and uh, this was weird. You know, it was a, it was a much uh, much simpler time in some ways, but um, the one thing I remember, in fact, um, I just had a teammate pass away tragically. Robert Reed was one of my favorite teammates. Great guy. Um, and so I talked to a couple of my teammates and one of the things we talked about, about being on the road, that was, um, kind of painful was that we flew commercial, right? So we're, there's only so many first class seats and there's not enough for an entire NBA team. So sometimes there'd be, you know, eight seats. And so one person, you know, was going to get a first class seat was Bill Fitch, the coach. And so, and then, you know, if you've got a first class seat, a lot of times Dick Vandervoort, our trainer, he would just hand you a boarding pass. Like you didn't necessarily get a signed seat. There wasn't a reservation with your name, whatever. And so he would pick who had to sit next to Bill Fitch and we called it the hot seat. And if, <laughs> if you got the hot seat, you had to talk basketball with Bill Fitch the whole time. And it was awful. It just was like, he just was going to grill you. I mean, you weren't going to be able to relax. You were going to have to have a talk to him the entire time. And if you had a flight yeah. from Houston to New York, oh man, it was like, <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was bad. The, but, the commercial no, was thing's bad. funny. I mean, you literally had – so we had yesterday on on Purple Daily, our Vikings podcast, we, we welcome in fans every Wednesday to – it's called Write That Down. We make predictions every week and bring fans in. And there was a guy who's been a Vikings fan since the 1960s, and he used to travel a lot in the 80s. And he said he was at the Detroit airport in 1987, like August of 87, and uh, he saw Burt Blylevin going by with a duffel bag. And then and he gets to another gate and he sees Kirby Puckett, Gary Gaetti, and like Kent Herbeck just clowning around, mm -hmm. like putting a $20 bill on the floor and seeing if random people would pick it up. <laughs> just killing. Like, can you imagine just a World <laughs> Series winning or an, or an NBA championship basketball team just dicking around at the airport gate in the 80s? <laughs> it's, it's pretty it's amazing. I tell people all the time. I mean, like Larry Bird sat, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson sat at the same airport terminal in, at the gate as everybody else. And in some ways, it kept you humble because, <laughs> yeah. you know, now there's like the velvet rope everywhere. I mean, everything is like cordoned off and everything is first class and five star. And and uh, you can keep the, the people at bay for, for the most part. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a whole different thing. I thought Finchie was talking about like last year when he was saying that about getting on the road because in some ways uh, they played better on the road than they played at home. But um, I mean, we played great at home. We played great on the road on on, on this particular season. And, and sometimes, you know, getting on the road, like um, when you're not playing particularly well can be a good thing, especially if players are hearing it from the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, the way we travel now, <laughs> I mean, going on the road is a nice thing, big time. Yeah. So, well, let's – we're still parsing apart exactly how long Cat is going to be out, if he's going to be out for a day or a month, and the team hasn't really um, pinned it down yet either. So the best we can do is just sort of discuss what they have if Cat's out, whether it's for a day or for 30 days. So I'm sure people have seen the Woj report, uh, meniscus injury, the Shams report, meniscus tear – uh, so we'll, we'll wait for the team to sort of diagnose this and figure out what the plan is going forward, Jim Pete, but let's yeah. say cat is out. Let's just take cat out for a day or for 30 days, whatever it's going to be. I'm actually still pretty optimistic. I mean, Nas Reed is going to get another 12, 15 minutes, maybe on some of these nights. Um, obviously it's a huge blow and cat was playing largely incredible this season. So I don't want to make it sound like it's not a blow, but I think a lot of people and just the commentary I've heard around the most of the national commentary is that, well, you can cross the Timberwolves off the board now. They're not going to win another game the rest of the season. I don't know, man, like 12 more minutes of Nas Reed, Kyle Anderson at the four filled in quite nicely last year when Cat was out for 50 games. So may maybe I'm just being optimistic, Phil, here. But um, what do you make of this team when Cat isn't playing, Jim Pete? Well, I gotta tell you, I'm in a couple text threads, and your tweet showed up, Phil, and like that was <laughs> uh -oh. very impressive. Uh oh, uh, you're yeah, because like they were like sh just stunned at a positive member of the media. Like that was um, <laughs> one of the most positive tweets I think that we've seen. So kudos to you for finding. Wow, a that's what I'm known light. for, Jim, shining a positive light <laughs> on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> um. 
yeah, you know what? I'm a I'm a saddle up and let's ride kind of guy. Like I, you know, you gotta you gotta sort of you know deal with injuries, and you can't sit there and look back too much, and you can't sit there and and navel gaze about oh my gosh, we're going to be in trouble now or whatever. I think that these guys are pretty confident. And luckily we have a lot of experience in playing with OutCat, um, you know, because uh, last year, you know, he came back at the end of the season when he played the last eight games or whatever of the year. And then he, mm-hmm. you know, was ready for the playoffs. But um, I, I, you know, I think that this team, um, you know, has another all NBA center to fall back on. And mm-hmm. that all, all, all NBA center is Rudy Gobert and, and is the, main impotence for why this team is good. And that's because, you know, defensive, we get stops. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times Kyle's a great matchup, you know, and you don't want to take Carl off the, off the floor a lot of times and put Kyle out there because Carl's a better player. But if you've got to bring somebody in the game, you're going to bring in really the best of both worlds because Nas gives you the offense you're missing when Carl is off the floor and then Kyle gives you some offense, but mainly all the defensive matchups, the switchability that he has. So I don't know. I'm not going to push the panic button at all. Um, I think that even with Carl, just looking at the schedule, if you guys analyzed our schedule coming out of the break, we we were kind of saying it's like in three parts. It's the, it's the seven game homestand. It's the six game road trip. And it's the pl- playing 10 of the last 14 at home yeah um, those four road games are hard though because you've got the lakers um you've got phoenix and you've got denver twice so we got to play three we still have to play the denver nuggets three times and even with carl yeah. anthony towns that was always going to be a challenge and two of those times are going to be on back-to-backs so yeah. the second night of the back-to-back so i don't know i'm, I'm not going to sit here and, and and think about it too much i'm just going to take each game and I'm going to say that we have the personnel to get it done. And I think that, you know, obviously you can't play the last 20 games with eight guys. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, right. So you've got to, you've got to go a little deeper in your bench. So, you know, Monte, Non, and Nas, um, they're going to, you know, that's the eight, right? So you got the starting five with Kyle and starting lineup. You got Monte, Na and Nas, and then Jordan McLaughlin's going to have to play. And then probably somebody else. And I'm guessing that somebody else is going to be Luca, unless mm, TJ Warren drives you. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, who 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 would you guys go to off the bench? You know, I mean, besides the three and then Jordan, are you going to are you going to trust TJ Warren, who's been sitting at can home? We, and, yeah. Can we probably, can we hop in a DeLorean? Can we hop in a DeLorean and go get 2020 bubble TJ Warren, who scored 50 <laughs> points? Yeah. 39, 35. Can we go get that, TJ Warren? It, w- it will be interesting. I mean, the, I didn't think about the Luca thing. That's really smart. And we'll see if he gets kind of unglued from the bench. But uh, I don't think you can say that it's like, I'm with you. I don't think I'd panic. It's also tough for everything else Carl's been going through. I mean, even last week and stuff, you just kind of ache for a guy that now is sidelined with another injury. But uh, I wonder if Finch will use it. And I guess for our weekly installment of you played Jim, I didn't. Like, did you ever have a situation like this playing days where you lost a teammate? Like, what not like for an injury or something? What the fans are kind of coping. Like, I'm coping, right? Like, I'm sad today because it's like, okay, they lost a starter, all star guy. But as the players, you just kind of thinking next man up. Is that like what the coaching staff and Finch are telling them as well? Is like, hey, this should be, or galvanize this and go. Well, hey, um, I started a lot of games in the NBA and. Um, you know, I was a role player, but, mm-hmm. um, if you look at my, if you look at my game log, I mean, don't, don't sit there and look too closely because it's not that <laughs> impressive statistically, but I did start a lot of games. Um, and I started a lot of games because there were a lot of injuries to Akeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson and, um, Ralph missed large swaths of time. Um, and the same thing is true for the dream. And so because those guys got hurt, it gave me a chance to start and to get a lot of experience. So, I mean, we went to the finals my second year in the NBA. So like that, that team was a young team. Um, we had no business necessarily beating the Lakers. So we beat them uh, in five games. And um, ha- had I not gotten that experience, I don't know if we'd have been as good. Um, Mitchell Wiggins got a lot of experience too for, uh, you know, but he was already kind of a veteran player, but I'm just saying that these kind of situations can make your team better. And so because yeah. Cat missed so much time last year, it set the stage for Nas becoming what he is. And so I think that the, 
the acclimation of Rudy Gobert into the system now, like he's so much more comfortable. Getting Mike though was so key. My, getting Mike Conley is I can't even tell you what an unbelievable table setter he is and how how it, what it's meant to the chemistry of this team. And then Monte Morris too. I mean, like this Tim Conley getting Monte Morris for this team gives you another solidifying guy. Uh, that when he's on the floor, I think you just feel really calm, cool, and collected like you feel with, with, with Mike as well. Well, and so the, the tweet, by the way, that, that we referenced that I put out, Optimistic Phil got happy Twitter fingers this morning and said, all right, what, it's, it, this is still a good team. And the silver lining that I put out there was, well, Nas Reed's only playing like 23 minutes on average, right? Because there's I mean, you got two of the best seven-footers in the, in the NBA – and so Nas Reed's limits, uh, his minutes are sort of limited. Well, you can deploy him for another 10 to 12 to 14 minutes on a lot of nights. And here's the best part. We love lineup combinations on this show. We, we devote large chunks of time to just going <laughs> through lineup combinations. Nas Reed and Rudy Gobert together on the court is a plus Good. 14 points per yeah. 100 possessions, yeah. which is a 24-point swing per 100 compared to last, last year when those year. guys were on the court together, which I want to come sure. back to that. But the but here's the crazy thing, and this is something, again, that they have to lean into this now that Cat's out. The be, of, of all the qualifying lineup combinations, so these are the sample size is like 600 minutes or more together. The best two-man pairing for the Timberwolves by a wide margin is Nas Reed and Anthony Edwards <laughs> on the court at the same time. So I think you, you have to start with and, and Jace Frederick was putting out some similar stats today, too. Okay, what works? Yeah. Nas and Anthony Edwards works. Nas and Gobert seems to work this year, Jim Pete. And then you can sort of build, you can still build out lineups that are going to win games down the stretch here. So I don't know. That's why, 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 here's my question for you How and why has Nas Reed been able to coexist so much better on the court with Rudy Gobert this year compared to last year when those guys were. Not a great pairing statistically. I think that Nas understanding spacing a little bit more, and I think he understands better what his what his role is. And I think that um, they the coaching staff has done a phenomenal job, um, sort of identifying everybody's role, and and so making it really clear. Nas spent a lot of time in Minneapolis. This has been the greatest stretch I think since Finchie's been here. This has been the greatest stretch of keeping players in town in the summertime working on their games. And so I think Nas just had a really good um, summer of reevaluating and, and reimagining himself. And so when you watch him play, I, and I say this all the time during broadcast, it's so great the way that he runs the floor and, and, he, and, he, and he spaces out to the corners. Mm -hmm. Like he understands it. And then he felt, if he's the trail – he also understands to get off it quickly. Like he's he's the best we have on our team understanding point five mentality of yeah. of dribble it, pass it, shoot it. And, and he's also a tremendous cutter too. And I love the actions that Finchie runs for Nas to get him the basketball on the move too. Like they 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 run him out of the corners, they'll stagger him out of the corners, they'll they'll run handoffs with him quick. Like you see Mike Conley run handoffs with Nas you know, in transition, he'll just come barreling down the paint, but also he's got the nuance to his game where cat tends to, to sort of hold the basketball more. He's, he, he doesn't cut all the time. I think he probably over penetrates. You're not going to see Nas, I think make bad decisions where, where cat, I think is so confident in his ability. Sometimes cat gets in trouble. And so I think Nas has just extinguished all of the, the, the indecision and bad in on the offensive end. And all he is, is he's just doing high percentage quality things on the floor. I just, I just can't say enough of how much I love his game, how simple it is, how he stays in his lane. He's either shooting a three or he's getting to the rim and there's yeah. really no in between yeah. his shot start is so clean. So I think that's it, Bill. I think he's just completely boiled his game down to what is the most important stuff. And he just does that. I think it's good, Phil, that you brought up that we don't really know yet, right? Like the Carl stuff, we got to let the team's got to kind of give us the final word and stuff. But in the meantime, while Carl is out, it does seem, I think Dane said this today, that it seems like Kyle Anderson will start in Carl's place. Yeah. But back to when you said that you, you know, you spot started a lot because you had guys in front of you that maybe were injured. Is there any truth or like, what was it like starting versus coming off the bench? Like, is there any real difference that from like a preparation standpoint, a mentality, or is it just kind of like, I'm playing minutes. It is what it is. 
you're playing against better players. Um, okay. And but you're also playing with better players. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> kind of a double edged sword. You know, it's like I, you know, as a bench player, um, when we played against the Lakers, um, I I guarded I, when I came up with the bench, I'm guarding AC Green. When I played against, you know, when I was starting, I'm guarding James Worthy. You know, so it's crazy. Um, there's a little bit of difference there. You know, um, when I'm playing against the Boston Celtics as a starter, I'm guarding Kevin McHale. When I'm uh, coming off the bench, I'm playing against Greg Kite. You know, it's like <laughs> it's just it's just a it, you know it's just a, it's a different thing. But um, from a mentality standpoint, I think the most important thing if you're a bench player though is when you come to the arena, you know how much you're going to play and when you're going to play. I think the most difficult thing the most difficult thing in basketball is to be a bench player, but you never know how much you're going to play or when you're going to come in. And so I think that's one of the things that Finchie's done a great job of is like guys kind of, you you kind of know when guys are going to come in. You know Carl and Ant are going to play the whole first quarter. Nas pretty much knows he's coming in for Rudy um, mm -hmm. at the you know, eight, nine minute mark. Um, the guards know when they're coming in. Mike's coming out early. Um, Monte's coming in. Nas coming in. Um, for Jaden or whoever. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that these guys know, like they know what their role is going to be. And so that's the main thing between starting and coming off the bench is just knowing when you're going to play. I want to go back to the, to the Luca Garza thing. He's been such a fun sort of just cult hero. And the, 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 when he does play in the G league, he puts up like 37 points and 16 rebounds and people, I think he gets the third loudest ovation when he checks into a game behind maybe I think it's like Nas Reed is number one in the arena. And then Anthony Edwards, you know, cat gets an ovation, they, you know, but he gets a very loud ovation. If they do deploy him in the interim here, what, what do you think? I mean, he can shoot, he can score, right? Is it defense? Like what, what kind of player do you think he is getting eight to 10 minutes in an NBA rotation? Is he ready for that? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what to expect from Finchie. And I think my my sensibility is that he's probably not going to play him that much. My thing is that yeah. you can't just play eight guys through twenty games. So foul trouble will have something to do with it. Yeah. Um, you know, need is going to probably dictate some of whether he plays or not. But also the matchup is also super important. I don't think that um, like Luca is a great matchup in in a um, in a game against the LA Clippers. Um, but. There are other there are other games or teams that he could maybe play against. So it's going to be really. I mean, this is going to be fascinating to me to yep. chronicle all this and and to and to watch it all unfold and see what Finchie's going to do because, um, um, in some ways, and I've said this from from the very beginning. In Finch, we trust. Is my is mm -hmm. Ben was my motto when he first came. I think that um, I'm going to trust Chris Finch to pull the right uh, levers and. Um, and I'm just going to, Hey, let's saddle up and ride. Cause you know, this is, we're the, all we have, you know? And yeah. so when you're on the road like this, it's kind of like this us against them uh, situation. So yeah. I'm, I'm just going to be fascinated to see how all this plays out. In, in Finch, we trust is a lot better than the other one going out there. That's man. I love Finch for a variety of reasons. You can probably figure that out, but, uh, <laughs> I, I am kind of just curious to you. you Phil might've got that one already. Uh, Jim, that's my biggest concern. The Carl stuff is just. The last 20 games, seeding, trying to figure this all out, solve the crunch time offense, you don't want to start playing guys more minutes, right? Like, you don't want to run these guys into the ground on the final lap of the mile when you should hopefully maybe be trying to dial back some of their minutes. So I'm with you on, like, a Luca Garza insertion or just maybe another bench guy that we haven't thought of. TJ Warren, we'll see if he makes any sort of a of a play. But um, it's tough news, so I'm interested to see what kind of the final diagnosis is. Well, and, and, you know, this, this is an opportunity, you know, it's like, this yeah. is where you, you, you get like something that happens that you completely unexpected and um, maybe Luca plays and maybe he does find a way to, to make an impact. You just mm -hmm. never know. And you want to know something that kid is, is wired like a gladiator. He puts the work in, he's so confident in his own ability like that's when you talk to Luca Garza, that dude is confident, man. Like he, like, I like, I like how he's wired up that way. So even though he hasn't played, if you plug him in, I wouldn't be surprised if he played well, you know? So yeah, I just think that they're going to try to put him in a, in a situation to be successful. I don't think Finchie's going to put him out there in a situation where he's going to struggle. So it's going to be uh, very interesting to see how it all works out.
Yeah. Hey, uh, I know you, you got to get going here, but you have been entrenched in the women's game uh, throughout your yeah. career as a coach. Caitlin Clark, since the last time we podcasted, passed Pistol Pete Maravich for the all-time men's or women's uh, total points leader in college basketball history. I believe she has sold out 29 arenas so far this year as well. Um, just your thoughts on Caitlin Clark, the player, breaking the record. And I, I think she's just elevating women's basketball to an even higher level these last couple of years. Well, my love for women's basketball is 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 very high and the amount of respect I have for the women's game. Having coached in the WNBA, it's I mean, I don't know if it's the it, it's probably the greatest thing that I've done um in basketball. I mean, playing the finals against Boston was pretty great. Uh, spending 26 years as a broadcaster with the Timberwolves has been really great. But those eight years coaching in the WNBA, being able to be around Cheryl Reeve and to see how great these players are, Lindsey Whalen, Rebecca Brunson, Simone Augustus, Janelle McCarville, Sylvia Fowles. Um, I tell Lindsey Whalen all the time, Maya Moore. Who, Maya yeah. Moore is probably the closest thing that I can compare to Caitlin Clark. The, amount of, the impact that Maya had because, you know, the links were terrible. And then – we became the championship team with Maya Moore yeah. and that's what Caitlin Clark. So we're sitting here in Indianapolis right now. Um, they are so excited about fever basketball here and now and what she's going to bring to the table. Um, the one thing that always bothered me, you guys, when I was coaching is when, when guys would come up to me and ask me, Hey, couldn't a really good high school team beat the Minnesota Lynx? And I just roll my eyes and be like, <clears throat> cause I know that I know the players hated it. They hate mm -hmm. they hate that question. Um, it, it's it's not the same game. It's a dumb question to compare women's basketball to men's basketball. And um, the only thing that I, I would say is like you know I bring guys into come practice. It was my job to get the guys team together. And uh, I remember young Tyus Jones when he was at Apple I, Valley I High was School. There. Was similar, I was there that one morning and like. Lifetime Fitness, uh, they were practicing, or real Lifetime Fitness, right, underneath Target Center. You were there Links, for that Links practice? Were having a practice. Yeah, I gave Tyus a ride home. That's like my 15 <laughs> seconds of fame. He was a senior <laughs> in high school, but I know, because like, Jim, I'm a fan of you at that time, too. We went to a movie one night. We can talk about that later. But you got <laughs> Tyus in there. He's committed to Duke. He runs with, you know, kind of the squad that plays against his the starters. Brother JD really. was, his brother, yep. J.D., was was also one of the original guys, guys team guys that I brought. Yeah, in. sorry to interrupt you. Keep going on that, story, But I remember Tyus no, playing against... So you, were, you were there the day that Simone Augustus crossed him up and made him fall to the ground? Like, Simone Augustus yep. gave him the pop, pop like, you know, yep. like, and, <laughs> and Tyus just crumbled. But, you know, I, I just don't, I don't like comparing the games. And so, mm -hmm. I also want to be honest, because, like, I don't really like comparing... And saying that she passed Pete Maravich either because it's different games. I mean, you wouldn't mm -hmm. say that about, you know, um, did anybody say anything about um, whoever passed uh, Bobby Hurley and the all-time assist leaders or Tom Gola, who was the all-time NCAA men's rebounding champion? Did anybody say anything about, you know, it's like I just don't want to compare the, the two things. Caitlin Clark is awesome in her own right. And the women's game – is in such a great spot right now because I mean, how many, I can't, I'm not sure even sure I can pick five NCAA men's players out right now, but I can it's, pick yeah. five Same. women's players out. I mean, between it's Caitlin obscuring. Clark, Cameron yeah. Brink, Paige Beckers, Juju Watkins, who's unbelievable. She's so fun to watch. Um, Angel Reese. And we have seen all these players play like, so um, uh, I think Caitlin Clark is fantastic. And I, I, I think that she needs to be celebrated big way, but, her scoring, she did not pass Pete Maravich. She well, she passed she passed Lynette Woodard. You know what I'm Mar saying? Like that, that's apples yeah. to apples. Maravich yeah. didn't have a three point line, right? Like I'm just trying to think back to that day. Did he play with a three point line? There was no there was no three point okay, line. So that's kind of Freshman couldn't play, so he only played three years. Okay. He did, you know, he did get 500 more shots up than Caitlin Clark mm -hmm. did, though. He he got his. I mean, that's pretty amazing to get out. I mean, she played four years and he got a 500 more shot. So um, anyway, it's it's just different. It's different things. But I cannot wait to see Caitlin Clark, what she's going to do yeah. to the WNBA. She is going to light it on fire. I am her biggest fan. It was, and by it was the way, cool. too, just an aside, because um, Jeff Munich and I, Jeff Munich, the day one Timberwolves employee, greatest guy 
just had a bobblehead made for himself with the Timberwolves. It's so good. Movie. It's great. We went. We went and saw the next Caitlin Clark too. Chloe Johnson. Did you guys um, see the article? Yeah. Who wrote uh-huh. the, uh, oh, Chip? Right. Chip. Like he wrote yeah. Scoggins. Yeah. Chip, Chip Scoggins. Scoggins. Start to mean. You got You got to read the 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 Chloe Johnson article that, that Chip Scoggins wrote because it's it's phenomenal. And so Mune and I and a bunch of guys, we went over and, and saw Chloe Johnson play over at Mountain Park Academy. And she's an eighth grader at Duluth Marshall. And she is unbelievable. She can shoot that thing. <laughs> wow. And she is, she is going to tear up the high school game. And she's going to be a phenomenal college basketball player. So she's the next Caitlin Clark. Chloe Johnson. Boy, what's what and what's the NIL situation gonna be like in four years when she's picking out <laughs> college, right? Yeah, Man. we'll sponsor yeah. her. Uh, we'll have her yeah, on the pod. She, yeah, I thought <laughs> I thought they just going back to the Maya Moore thing, I thought it was cool because Caitlin Clark is like a celebrity and is one of the coolest athletes in the league. And then before that game, she broke the record, Phil. She got to meet I think her idol, Maya Moore. Maya Moore was at that game. And just to see Caitlin Clark, who's like a celebrity, kind of just melt like I would and seeing one of my well, heroes. You know, like how Caitlin, I, when I golf Caitlin, with you. <laughs> Caitlin, uh, Caitlin came to a lot of Lynx games growing up. Like she came oh, up really? and saw a okay. lot of games. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that um, that Cheryl Reeve used to always say, because every year we'd have camp a camp game. Um, I don't know if you remember that at all, Kyle. The camp game with all the so kids? it's a it's a yeah it's, it's all the kids come from yep. all the different camps, and so it's the loudest game of the year because all these kids do is scream. It's crazy. <laughs> but, um, it's the loudest, most annoying game of the year. <laughs> but the thing that Cheryl Reed would always say in the locker room before the game, and I always remember this, she's like, you know what, ladies, we're going to go out here and we're going to play and we're going to influence a bunch of young boys who would never think to like watch a women's game. And we're going to go out here and we're going to influence these kids and show, show them how great we are and how great this game is. I'm paraphrasing, you know, I'm, but mm-hmm. that was the general gist of it. And she was right because over the years I've had so many, young men come up to me now that are at camp because i've been i coached in the wnba from 2009 to 2016 so i spent a lot of time and and i'll be darned cheryl's right like i've had a lot of guys come up to me and say you know what i saw Maya Moore play i saw lindsey whalen play and it was it was one of my best memories as a fan you know i was watching those women play those links games were so great and that's why i say it was like my favorite thing i've done in basketball is those women and how you know one of the they're all warriors and it was just so much fun to be a part of that and jim just real quick uh so my wife and i lived in seattle we lived we were neighbors with kyle in, in portland for a couple of years and so we we didn't live there long enough to get like you know a full history of seattle sports but i can tell you being there for two years the most popular athlete in seattle was sue bird yep hey like Hands down, more. I mean, Russell Wilson had left and had sort of gone off the other side, but Sue Bird was like in terms of Q score. Take any Mariners player that was active, any active Seahawks player, the Sonics. Uh, Sean Kemp had a weed shop down the street, so his yeah. Q score was pretty high. But <laughs> but Sue Bird is Seattle, and mm-hmm. and I and I went. I I think Lindsey Whalen is Mount Rushmore of Minnesota sports figures. You know, I homegrown agree. the last 10, 15, 20 years. So it's. It's good to see, and it's it's good to see some of these women who are elevating, elevating basketball. You know, it's just amazing that the women haven't been playing really on a high level, competitive like national TV kind of thing since the early eight. I mean, the NCAA didn't even accept them in until it was eighty three, eighty two. Yeah. When when um, I forget the other name of the league, right? I'm just is the is the AIA. Does that sound right? Um, AIA. I think it. I think, I think it's that's a. So because that's that's why Lynette Wood is the Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women. So they weren't even right. NCAA. When you go yeah. to some of these websites and try to look up NCAA statistics, you can't look up Lynette Woodard and what her stats were, because yeah. she wasn't part of the NCAA at the time. So we we forget that women's sports is in its infancy in a lot of ways, and so all of the attention that they're getting right now, and I I hope that they get paid what they deserve mm-hmm. to get paid and that, and that people supporting them. And then also television contracts that these women can get paid so they can stay in America. You know, that's the hard thing for them is that a lot of times they've had to go overseas to make their money. They make their name in the WNBA, but then to make 
like the money. They got to go overseas and play. So they're playing year round. And it just was such a, a meat grinder for them. I just want them to be able to make enough money to stay here and yeah. entertain our fans. F- financially, your best options are NIL in college, Europe, and then three, maybe WNBA. And that needs to change at some point. That's kind of crazy. Yep. Yep. Well, Jim Pete in you, uh, rep- reporting from Indianapolis on the road in his glorious beige hotel room. <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll look for you and Grady on the Bally's broadcast tonight. Enjoy the road trip, and we'll we'll see what happens here with Carl Anthony Towns in the coming weeks, man. Thanks for coming on It'll again. It'll be an interesting week the next time we check in next Thursday. So, yeah, we'll have fun. Good luck on the golf course. Thank you. <laughs> see you. <laughs> All right, Jim Pete, Jim Peterson. Jim Pete Hoops on Twitter or X. For those of you who uh, enjoy social media, hey, before we bring Ross in for a random wolf of the week here, Kyle, a shout out to our friends at First Equity Mortgage. So I've told you guys for a few weeks now, I had a great experience refinancing my home about seven or eight years ago with David over at First Equity. First Equity is a Minnesota-based, 24 years in the market, by the way, a company that prides themselves on supporting the community treating every customer as a friend and a neighbor. David is a huge Timberwolves and Lynx fan going back 20 years as a season ticket holder. Uh, So check them out at First Equity. That's femort.com, First Equity Mortgage, femort.com, or scornorth.com, keyword David. Before we get to Random Wolf of the Week, you brought up the Wolves' ownership situation. I think we were just BSing off the microphone. Um, We've got like three weeks left until... Just can we just pay for it? I'm just I'm not like that nervous, but can just can we just, you know, just take that little credit card, you know, one point five billion dollars, whatever, that last payment. Are you hearing anything? Do you sense anything? Should we calm down? What do you what's your quick ownership thought, Kyle? I've tried to be pretty open with this, right? No desire to report. Leave that to the smart big people that cover the team on a daily basis. But uh I think it's worth noting because last week we talked about it both on this podcast. I know Doogie's been kinda all over it with the side that he has and the angle he has, and it's really smart to listen to everything he's been saying about it. I know Krasinski kind of had an update as well on The Athletic. Yesterday, Dane Moore and I did pretty deep dive on his podcast, stuff he heard. I've kind of been more concerned just because it's taken so long, and it's just like this team doesn't need this, right? Like just everything prior to the cat injury has been so normal. The organization's well run. Um, But yeah, for what it's worth, as I've said before, like there are people that – in a rod's camp that i've talked to and i kind of heard recently that no concern so again i know my q score is not nearly as high as anyone else i just mentioned but uh i've kind of gotten a vibe that they're not that concerned that they do have three more weeks they kind of if you want to call it due diligence i know it's taken 24 26 months but i'm not really concerned i do think they will land this plane and they will get majority ownership which as doogie has always said doesn't mean it has to be, I think, 50%. I think it just has to be like a controlling, mm-hmm. I don't know how many percent. But uh, I think Mark and Alex will get this thing across the finish line. I'm not nearly as concerned, but I think it's a big deal. We don't have to do it today, but it's a big deal to know that the ownership plane will land because now, again, you know, this Carl Anthony Towns injury, however long it may be, I, I know it sounds super hot takeish. It's more just how I was thinking, not feeling. But, you know, if he's out for the season, is... Is this the last time you'll ever see him play in a Timberwolves jersey? Uh, that's really pessimistic. Optimistic, it's like maybe this, for whatever reason, buys new ownership this excuse to be like, whatever happens in the playoffs, we want to see it run back again, and we'll we'll pay the tax. So there's going to be a lot that comes out from this injury, but I think first we just need to see what the actual diagnosis is. But recently I've been told to not worry about it, and uh, there will be a, a new ownership press conference coming this spring or this summer, whatever it okay. may be. Okay, yeah, just, uh, you know, if you're Mark, you're Alex, you know, just Venmo, PayPal, just uh, your Amex, whatever yeah. whatever you need, just make that last little payment, and we can all move on. What does Doogie always say? Don't don't aggregate this. Like, I can't imagine anyone's <laughs> going to aggregate Kyle Tuggy, but uh, for my what it's favorite, worth. My favorite from Dukes, I think it was last week, I don't remember what the subject matter was, but he said, please don't aggregate this, and then he said something. And Joe Nelson from Bring Me the News, I think it was Joe, <laughs> Bring Me the News, literally like in the article on Bring Me the News, aggregated, Dookie said, Bring Me the News, do not aggregate this. But here's what he said. <laughs> so, all right, let's get Ross in here, our producer extraordinaire for a random Wolf of the Week. Ross and I went last night with a couple of uh, fr- friends, coworkers. We went to the Gopher Indiana basketball game, and it was a top three ugliest game in the history of American <laughs> professional or collegiate basketball 
but we're sorry, a... Gophers fans. We're we're sorry. We'll take our share of the blame. But they whatever they've that kind is. of what Jim said. I can't name five college basketball men's players. I will in a couple of weeks when I build a bracket and think I know everything. But uh, the Gophers are kind of good this year, right? Or like they've improved. W- way men's? better. Well, yeah, okay. way better than expected, and way better than they've okay. been the last few years. They're like okay. five hundred in conference. Played kind of a weak schedule, and the Big Ten's down, but. We don't have to apologize. Go, gophers are gophers are going to make a little run in the NIT, and we're all going to stock up. It. Okay, <laughs> we're going to hang a banner, Kyle. That's that's all we want to do. Yes, yes. So Ross is going to bring us a series of clues that leads us to a random Timberwolf from the franchise's history. So far, we've done fifteen of these. Kyle has nine wins. I have six. I picked up my sixth win, correctly guessing Felipe Lopez that uh, last week. Good work. Good Before work. then, it was it was Kyle with Corey Brewer, Andre Kirilenko, and J.R. Ryder. So we each get up to three incorrect guesses to shout out whenever we want to. If one of us hits a third strike, the other person wins automatically. Here we go. Random. All right, boys. No Clue Googling. number one. This random wolf of the week would classify as what we call an NBA journeyman. Okay. I've given you that one before. This is a journeyman. So many though. I feel like most Timberwolves players in history are. Can you how many Timberwolves players aren't journeymen in the history of the franchise? Seven. Five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> heat check, boys. Who do you got? Oh, that's right. We get a free heat check, right? Mo Williams. It's not Mo Williams. Okay. Good one. That's a good one. Journeyman. What era are you in here? Journeyman. I'm gonna go. All right, I'm going to go Wayne Ellington. It is not Wayne Ellington. You can never have Wayne Ellington be the answer, by the way. I don't care what the algorithm says. Don't let Phil get this. Clue number two. Phil almost always seems to know where I'm going with these clues. He goes, what era are you in? Well, clue number two will help with that. This random wolf of the week last played in the NBA during the 2018-19 NBA season. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. A little Venn hmm. diagram here between my my focus and Phil's focus. This random wolf of the week played in over 700 NBA games. Okay, so we've got we've got the era here. And it's a weird it's kind of a weird era for Tim Rolls basketball. This random wolf of the week has played in a final Four. That's where Kyle and I, oh. our combined college basketball knowledge, is going to really help us here. Shoot. In his two seasons with the Minnesota Timberwolves, this random wolf of the week averaged 4.6 rebounds per game. Whoa, I'm way off. Okay. Okay. This random wolf of the week played college basketball in the Big East. That's a like this that's like a pretty good. significant amount of rebounds for like a journeyman. Yeah, bench four and player. A half is a good amount. That's like top five on the team in probably rebounds per game. That's like twice what Jaden averages, and I like Jaden. It might be more than twice what Jaden averages. <laughs> it might be four point six more rebounds per game than Jaden averages. <laughs> This random wolf of the week. I lost my spot. Sorry, apologies. Run it back. This random wolf of the week averaged a career high 8.7 points per game in the 2011 2012 NBA season. Okay. So, guy could score a bit, could also rebound a bit. Boy, is this like, it's like a Rick Adelman team? This Crazy. random wolf of the week is six foot eight inches tall. Oh man, we're just In, indirectly. We'll be tapping into what I believe is some of Kyle's knowledge here on the next clue. This random wolf of the week was the 33rd overall pick in the 2009. NBA draft. Oh, dude. 2009? 
I know oh. you know drafts. You go, you go, you go deep into the drafts and the history. So that might help you. This is clue number ten, gentlemen. Are you? That's ready? the Wayne Ellington draft, isn't it? It it looks so like he... you guys are both marinating on something right now. No, I'm I. I was well. This isn't a guess, but I was just focused on Jeff Teague, and now it's not Jeff Teague by any means. So now I'm stuck. This random wolf of the week played college basketball for my guy Jay Wright at Villanova. So he probably faced off against Johnny Flynn in the in like the Big East tournament. Yeah, dude. Yeah, because that 2009 Ross. 33rd overall pick? 2009. That's the Johnny Flynn draft. That's the Johnny Flynn draft. Yeah. Oh, God. So he was literally facing. You know I'm going through it right now. Why are you bringing this up? One of the most stressful drafts of my life. This random wolf of the week, again, not planned, but was drafted by the team Kyle spends a lot of time in. Portland. This random wolf of the week was drafted by Portland. Which could mean anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That could mean that they drafted him and then that pick got moved around five times. And This random wolf of the week was never signed by the Minnesota Timberwolves. He was only traded to them in 2012. No, you guys are going to no. make me... That one you, guys are gonna, you guys are going to make on, me on, come up on. with clues Slow. on on the fly. Are you out? No, I got more. Okay, okay. <laughs> this is this is wild because this was a fun era of Timberwolves basketball. But this is they had so they had like their Rubio love. They had a couple stalwarts in Pekovic, and everything else was so transient around those guys for a number of years. It's, Wait, oh, I no. have a no. How many guesses do we get? Three. Three. When we neither one of us, the heat check doesn't count. Heat checks don't count. Okay, I'll I'll throw it a guess because I know people that are listening to this. I love the YouTube commenters. Like I got on the first one because Phil and I are not great at this. It's not Taj Gibson, is it? It is not Taj Gibson. Okay. Phil, care to guess with Kyle? I love the 2012 Timberwolves. I just want to throw that out there. I think that <laughs> oh, was my guy knows it. Congrats. 2012-13, that was the team, I think, that had one of the best, it had like the seventh best net point differential, like a 50-win pace team that finished with 40 wins and because they couldn't hold on to a lead. Oh, oh. And I'm trying to think of those rosters. It, I, I can name, I can, Kyle, you've we probably played this game. We've probably done this on the show. We've probably named this team. Obviously, you guys know this, but this random wolf of the week, you've narrowed it down did play for Rick Adelman as a member yep. of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Keep going. It's going to turn here, okay? Okay. So they traded for him off of his rookie contract. So it's not Taj. Again, this is the second random wolf of the week where something you it's guys not, have okay. said. Is it Anthony Tolliver? Is that a it's guess? Not, yeah. It is not Anthony Tolliver. Okay, okay. Keep, I, cooking. I just, Keep cooking, Ross. A couple random wolves in a row now. You guys have said something on the pod that has been in a predetermined clue, okay? So here we go with this one. If you liked Wayne Ellington, you probably didn't love the trade that brought this random wolf of the week to Minnesota. Dante Cunningham. That go. is correct, Nice Kyle. job, dude. That, nice that job. Was, I, needed, I needed 11 nice clues there. Dante Cunningham. Gosh. Dante, I, They've had a lot of Dante Cunninghams in their now. franchise history. Like the six foot eight, talented <laughs> wing. You know? I think he was a good guy, like by all accounts. I mean, I was a decade younger. But uh, it, it, I do think the Wolves have had a Dante Cunningham on their team for 35 years. They have, yeah. So Absolutely. I also was looking up one of the clues here. The next clue that I was going to get to was... When examining the Minnesota Timberwolves all-time roster in alphabetical order, this <laughs> random wolf of the week can be found between Jarrett Culver and Bill Curley. 
If oh, that God. doesn't sound like random wolves of the week right there. Those are two great ones. Those yeah, are Bill, two good ones. Bill Curley. The Bill wolves, Curley. The Wolves drafted, you're right, Phil. Good work by you. Quick to sum this up. The Wolves drafted 14 guys in the 2009 NBA draft, right? Like they had Rubio. They Wayne had Ellington Curry. was in that draft, wasn't he? Well, they at 18, or they Ty did Lawson. draft Ty Lawson, but then traded him. Ty Lawson, I also loved because I'm a UNC guy. Wayne Ellington at 28. Taj Gibson went 26th to the Bulls. He went to USC. I'm an idiot. And then Cunningham <laughs> went 33. couple more names to close the show for the week. Nick Calathis from Florida at 45. Hank Norell at 47. And Patty Mills was drafted 55th. Patty so, Mills. It's Patty nice, Mills. nice value with the 55th pick right there. So, all right, gentlemen. Heck of a show here. Jim Good Peterson work, from the Beige Hotel Room in Indianapolis. <laughs> Ross Brendel with the Random Wolf of the Week here. Please be sure to give us a five-star rating if you enjoy the podcast and a positive review on the Apple and uh, Spotify podcast pages for this podcast. And then click that like button and the subscribe button on the Score North YouTube channel. Okay, Kyle. Daylight savings. We'll, we'll Sunday. Set the clock. Oh, is that this? That's Sunday. Spring forward. So we Don't fall forget. back. Yeah, we spring forward. Shout out to whoever created that, because otherwise I won't remember. But yeah, spring forward Sunday. Go Wolves. We're we're here with life advice for you on this Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.